In our tour of the RCA Vernon Valley facility, uh, I think we've seen enough to tell us that not only is the integrity of the bird constantly being monitored and constantly being watched, but there are probably more precautions here to ensure that the signals we receive on an ongoing basis are of the very highest, almost if not um, literally broadcast signal noise and broadcast color phase purity and so on a level uh, as is humanly possible to achieve. Um, uh, with today's technology. Um, Archie, the, the bird has proven to be a very good bird, hasn't it? Both of them have been to this point, and you've, uh, um, you've got a running record now that ought to give you a pretty, pretty secure feeling as to what kind of an animal you have up there and what you can expect of it. Is there, is there some comments you'd like to make at this point, having gone through what we've gone through? Sure. Well, of course, uh, many of these things we've discussed in our a little tour out here and of some of the properties of the bird and so on. But we feel that we have a very highly reliable spacecraft that is certainly providing quality communications. I think it's unfortunate maybe that there have been some of these rumors and that some of these things have been attributed back to attitude problems in the spacecraft and so on. I hope that we have some of the things we have said hope help to dispel these, uh, uh, these things. We also feel that we have a, a very reliable spacecraft from the power standpoint. That we've got a lot of power, I think, as we showed before, that we can carry 24 transponders through the eclipse season and uh, provide good, reliable uh, year-round communications. In spite of that, there's bound to be the ongoing rumors that there's something wrong with the thing. And uh, um, mm -hmm. now, personally, I'm, I've seen everything I I, I could I could possibly ask to be shown. You folks have been just super about the openness of the operation and what it does and wh how you how you run it. Um, are there any are there any is there any foundation at all to any rumor that affects say the solar panel integrity or the um, the 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 uh, the, uh, the voltage capacity of the solar cells or current capacity? Is there anything at all that you can think of that? that uh, would uh, lend any credence to any of the rumors that we hear in the industry today? Yes, well, I think that there probably is a, a little basis for that. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's some of the confusion is that it was applied to F1 because that was the area of interest of the cable operators particularly and of a large number of our video customers, but that the problem had actually occurred with, with F2. It has caused us no difficulties or problems in operation, but in March 1976, shortly after the launch of F2, it was determined that uh, there is a cable that is adjacent to the drive shaft for the solar array, where the solar array is going around like this, and that uh, during the launch sequence, that cable had popped loose from a couple of clips, and it presented an area in which there was high torque in the drive. Now. Uh, as a result of that, we have been using nightly a system where we, when the array gets around to a certain point under computer control, we merely reverse it and bring it around to the other side and pick the sun back up again. Uh, we feel right at the moment, however, that there probably, um, that that to high torque area has disappeared. The cable has moved again, and we really feel that there's uh, uh, no significant problem at all. There really is no significant problem now because it hasn't caused us any power problems and because it has not uh, indicated any serious degradation in the batteries, there's been no real pressure to find out whether or not the cable is still there. So we are still operating in that mode. And I think possibly that uh, bit of information, which was, uh, which was distributed to the industry in March of 76, but that was a long time ago, and may have been uh, may have been forgotten that that may have been the basis for the rumors about F1, but F1 is alive and well, <laughs> and so is F2. <laughs> <laughs> Let uh, let's ask Bob Youngblood here. Bob, what is it that you specifically uh, do on a day-to-day -day basis as relates to this facility? And then I've got a couple questions that follow up a little bit on what uh, what Archie was uh, explaining to us. Well, I'm I am basically a technical advisor to the controllers and to Mr. Miller. I'm an engineer with uh, appreciable experience in this field, and uh, back to the ATS. What were you telling me earlier? Two, one, one. Yeah. <laughs> well, they don't, the they, right. they don't go back any further than not that. Not much, not much. It was syncom, but uh, that's about it. But my uh, basic function is to uh, oversee any technical 
uh, factor. Yeah, let's get both arrays pointed <laughs> the same way, please. So they as to not start a rumor right, that they independently yes, rotate. Yes, huh? they do yeah. not. They are, they are <laughs> solidly uh, hooked together on the real bird. Although the model, we can turn off half of the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, would that be a design uh, a suggestion you'd make for a future bird for any reason you could think of? No, nope, they, nope. built, they built ATS-6 <laughs> that way. I, don't, I never did figure out why. Oh, they did? Yeah. <laughs> it's built this way. I see. I see. Well, in case the sun moves, in case we ever get two suns, well, how's that for yeah, an explanation? I think so. I think they wanted to power it from moonlight. <laughs> moonlight, all right. Why don't you take this model, because I can't uh, hold everything. Okay. And let's run back over what, uh, what Mr. Miller was saying. Um, the panels track. Yeah, panels track, track the sun on as, uh, we show, as you were shown earlier by Mr. Miller with a, essentially a regular 24-hour clock motor inside the bird. And what are the, give me some numbers. How uh, often does this, this steps it? And that is to say it, it takes yeah. a little tiny step a at a time. A little tiny step every 34 seconds. All right. And this is and all controlled by the computer? This is all controlled by logic within the spacecraft. Oh, okay. Redundant logic in the bird. Okay. Two complete drive systems. All right. So as this goes it in... Goes very slowly, moves uh, one revolution per day, tracking the sun, as the bird itself, of course, is turning in the opposite direction. The panels are really standing still in space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At some point now, as... At some point, as we come around to about here... We, the cable is, or the, uh, the array is about to enter the zone in which we had at one time detected some high torque, some uh, excess friction because of the loose cable. So at that point, every evening, we command the array by under computer control to go into a, a fast reverse mode. And it slews all the way around like that to the... Well, let me help. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, now we got them both going again. And we sit here for about uh, half an hour, just parked, till the sun catches up to us again. Mm -hmm. Because we slew a little bit faster than the sun moves, and we start the array, and it continues its regular rotation. Okay. Uh, how wide, then, is that dead spot we're looking at? Uh, we stay a few degrees? The, the real dead spot is only four or five degrees wide, but just to be safe, we stay away from 30 degrees. All right. Now, one of the one of the um, uh, more advanced stories that relates to this uh, ill-founded rumor is that when you do go into the fast reverse mode and bring it back around, you do, of course, at that point, go into the battery supply mode. Yes. And people have been heard to say that when that happens, then you're going into a discharge cycle each day, as opposed to only during the eclipse periods. And this, they forecast, will shorten the long term life of, of the bird. Can you deal with that uh, since if we don't, it'll go on okay, forever? It is correct that we go into batteries every night throughout the year. On F2, we use about a quarter of the capacity of the batteries during this rewind operation. And we can tolerate up to three quarters of the capacity and still operate the spacecraft. But uh, I have been monitoring the battery condition, and some experts in the field have also, over the past couple of years, we've seen no evidence whatever of battery degradation due to this usage. In fact, there is some feeling within the battery industry that uh, frequent use is better for NICADs than occasional use. We uh, remind them that they are, in fact, batteries. They will forget if you never use That's correct. Them. There's a memory factor there. Yeah. Well. One of the things, of course, prior to each eclipse season, that's one of the things that we do. We deep discharge the batteries to recondition them so that they do remember how much capacity they have. So in about the two weeks, in the period of about two weeks, ten days prior to the onset of each of the eclipse seasons, we take each one battery at a time and uh, uh, put a discharge resistors across them and discharge them, deep discharge them and then recharge them so that they will remember. And they have responded uh, very well to this. We see no, uh, no problems whatsoever. And since you're the man that constantly, as you have shown us, constantly monitors the uh, function of this bird, there isn't anybody that's better equipped to say that, is there, than you? I don't feel so. <laughs> <laughs> that leaves us with one possible um, kind of uh, derivation of this rumor that we probably better deal with. If there's any left at all, let's deal with them all. And that is that if we're going into this fast reverse, which is what, a 40-minute function, yeah. I think you said? 40 me? minutes, right. Um, is there any kind of mechanical wear, tear, or other kind of degradation on the, on the, uh, on the rotation system, the shafts, the motors, anything of that sort that uh, will in any way affect the lifespan of this bird? 
None whatever. The uh, the motor system is capable of about ten times the uh, the required torque from the, the that the solar arrays need, and we have a completely redundant system. We have a, a totally separate uh, array drive that we check out once a year just to make sure everything's still okay. But we've never touched it. And it's running fine. Archie, have we, have we missed anything in terms of, um, have we left any ground where somebody can say yes, but they didn't say? Can you think of anything well, at all? The only uh, thing, of course, is that uh, and when you get to talking about the life of the spacecraft, we've been concentrating on power, and certainly that is one of the, the limiting factors in the total life of the spacecraft. This spacecraft was designed for seven years of life. Uh, the the things that would limit that would be batteries and fuel. As we've gone into quite deeply here, we feel that the batteries are doing very well, have no reason to anticipate any problems in that. The other thing, of course, is fuel, and there has been discussion about how much thrusting we have been doing and so on and so forth. We do very little thrusting, actually, other than that plan for normal maneuvers. Uh, we feel right now, with some certain, the way we're operating the bird now, that we have fuel probably uh, to close to nine years of operating life. Which oh. is at least two years beyond the yeah. normal plan use. Maybe, yes, about two years beyond the uh, design lifetime of the spacecraft. So we figure we're in, in very good shape. If the fuel will run nine years and the batteries are in great shape, this may be a naive question, but what then determines, I guess, I guess it becomes the fuel still at the nine-year point, doesn't it? Well, uh, obviously when you have anything that's that old, whether it's your Edsel or, uh, or some <laughs> other machine, as it gets older, there are things that go wrong with it. And certainly you're going to expect over a period of time. We have redundant equipment built in for almost everything of major importance in the, in the spacecraft. But you will start to lose things. You will replace them with redundant things. You may lose uh, transponders ultimately. They have being tubes. They have some finite life. There are various things that happen. You get to a point where to determine uh, whether it's worth keeping the bird in its position for the amount of cu communications capability you're providing and uh, what it's costing you to operate it, uh, then that's a trade-off you make whether you there has been some discussion if we had two birds that got toward the end of life, maybe we might fly them together and use half of one, what was left on one and what was left on the <laughs> other. Side, side by side. Side by side. <laughs> and um, that would make our life a little interesting in flying two side by side. We can do it, and, uh, and it has been done before. Uh, when we transferred the traffic from F1 to F2, we've, uh, in the beginning when we uh, transferred the Alaskan traffic, we flew the two birds within about 12 kilometers of one another and just switched receivers and no one... I hardly knew the difference when we made the switch. That's I think we could do it again if we had to. When they say handing off traffic, that's almost literal, wasn't it? It was literally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there, Bob, is there, um, is there any such thing as a rule of thumb? We're into this now, and I, I don't think we're, we'd, be, we'd be remiss to cover the topic. Is there any such thing as a rule of thumb as to how many transponders um, a bird such as SATCOM can reasonably be expected to lose, say, a year or every two years. You know, I'll tell you the kind of rule of thumb I hear from people. They say in a 24-channel bird, one transponder per year, for whatever reason, you know, whether it's a resistor or whatever, is going to quit. And that, that, uh, the, they, they say a, a person, therefore, an engineer, plans in a seven-year life to lose seven tr transponders. Now, is that a... I've heard that rule of thumb. I do not necessarily subscribe to it. I think it is uh, conservative. I don't think you lose that many normally. Well, your experience here, Archie, is quite the contrary, is it not? You've got, uh, I'd, we'd have to stop, uh, I'd have to stop and figure out how many years and transponders, but you've, uh, you, you just haven't had that kind of, quote, failure rate so far. No, we have not. No. We, we, are, uh, we feel that uh, we're running well below that and the kinds of problems that we've had. So. Um, then I don't think we've left anything un untouched in the sense of the reliability of the system, the bird itself, and uh, the rumors about what's wrong with it. There ain't anything wrong with it, first yeah, of all. No, there's not. I think uh, you certainly have been through all of this today, and we've uh, tried to show you what we can to show you that uh, it is a good and reliable bird. And uh, we hope you've <laughs> gotten that impression from it. <laughs> well, I have, and I hope that the uh, cable industry has as well. Mr. Miller, sir, you have been a very generous host today. We have uh, we have done a lot of things to your uh, normal operation, which I'm sure you would just as soon weren't done with television cameras and people traipsing around. Thank you, sir, very much for uh, for your time today. Bob, likewise. Our pleasure. Thank you.